He was a preacher's kid from South Dakota who volunteered for pilot training to prove to himself that he was not a coward. As a 24-year-old pilot, he seemed almost unnaturally calm and in control, a premature adult chosen to lead a crew of children into war. As a bomber pilot in World War II, he flew missions into the most dangerous skies in the world. And against all odds, he always brought his crew back safely. He returned to South Dakota after the war, dedicated his life to public service, spent more than 20 years in the United States Senate, and at one of his country's darkest moments, ran for president. He is George McGovern, and he is a legend of air power. George Stanley McGovern was born July 19, 1922 in the Wesleyan Methodist Parsonage in Avon, South Dakota. His father, Joseph, was a professional baseball player turned Methodist minister. His mother, Frances, a soloist in the church choir. The Depression started in South Dakota almost 10 years before it struck the rest of the country, and most everyone McGovern met growing up was in desperate financial straits. We were all poor, and consequently, we didn't know we were poor. There was nothing to compare yourself to. There weren't any rich people in South Dakota in the 1920s. McGovern was five years old when Charles Lindbergh flew from New York to Paris. Even in the isolation of the Dakota Plains, the details of Lindbergh and the flight were all anyone talked about. I was old enough to know that this was the greatest man in the world. That's what we thought at the time to make that flight all alone across the uh, Atlantic Ocean, the first human being to do that. <clears throat> he was a hero to everybody. In 1928, the McGoverns moved to Mitchell, a town of around 12,000 in southeastern South Dakota. There, the McGoverns bought their first house, and the family that had moved from town to town and church to church settled in. Every young man has a defining moment an experience that clarifies in his own mind what he is really all about. McGovern's came in a confrontation with a well-respected local coach and gym teacher. I was probably, uh, I don't know, maybe 13 years old, 13 or 14, and we had a coach, he was a wonderful coach by the name of Joe Quennell. I, I greatly admired him as did the other boys. One day, Quintal asked his class to jump over a leather horse, duck their heads, and roll in a kind of aerial somersault. It was a typical and not particularly difficult gymnastic move, but McGovern couldn't bring himself to do it. I'd run up to that horse and I'd stop, stand there. The whistle blew. It was Joe Quentel. What the hell is the matter with you, Mac? I said, well, Mr. Quentel, I can't do that. I just can't dive, I'll break my neck of it. He said, you see these other boys doing that? I said, yes. He said, you know why you can't do that? You're a physical coward. God, imagine that in front of 75 or 80 guys. It just cut me right to the quick. From that point forward, McGovern nursed a dread that he was indeed a coward. When he graduated high school, he enrolled in Dakota Wesleyan College, just down the street from his home in Mitchell. A friend of his was trying to organize a chapter of the civilian pilot training program on campus. If he could get 10 students to sign up, the government would pay for an airplane and an instructor. McGovern, who had never been up in an airplane, signed on. I think I did it in part to show Joe Quentel that I wasn't a coward. I couldn't jump over that horse. I still can't today do that. I'd break my neck, I think. But I wanted to show him I wasn't lacking in courage. McGovern learned to fly in a two-seat Aronka. He soloed after eight hours of flight training. When he landed, he felt charged up in a way he had never felt before. He'd proved something to himself and in a way to Coach Quintal. 
1941, his civilian flight training complete, McGovern looked up into the sky and saw a formation of B-24s passing high overhead. Based in Omaha, Nebraska, the B-24 crews were training for a war that was clearly about to engulf the world. McGovern looked up at the planes and thought that if war came, he'd be ready to serve as a pilot. George McGovern was a sophomore at Dakota Wesleyan University when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. When he heard about the attack, he, like most Americans, had no idea where Pearl Harbor was. No television then, it was just the radio uh, reports. And somehow by the end of the afternoon, I figured I was going to be involved in war. I didn't quite know how or even how it worked, but I think by six o'clock that night on Sunday, December 7th, I knew I was, I was going to be involved in war sometime in, in the near future. 24 hours later, McGovern and nine other Wesleyan students had cooked up a plan to travel to Omaha and enlist. I felt it was a patriotic duty. The country had been savagely attacked. I thought the biggest danger from what I had read still came from Nazi Germany. Japan seemed an awfully far away place, and I thought the main test would come in Europe, but I felt an obligation. The contingent from Dakota Wesleyan hit the road in two borrowed cars, and on the way debated whether they should join the Army or the Navy. When we got there, one of the guys picked up a rumor that if you went to the Army Air Corps recruiting office, they'd give you a free meal ticket to a downtown Omaha cafeteria. So on the strength of that unsubstantiated rumor and a meal ticket probably worth about a dollar, all 10 of us joined the Army Air Corps. It's the cheapest I've ever sold out. The Army Air Corps, however, was in no shape to accept thousands of new recruits. There were not enough airplanes, instructors, or even bases for the flood of volunteers. McGovern and his friends signed a letter of intent that declared they would enlist when the Army could take them. Then they went home. McGovern spent the next year at Dakota Wesleyan waiting for the Army Air Force to call. During this period, he wooed and won the hand of Eleanor Stegeberg, a pretty sophomore who'd once beat him in a debate and who had more recently outscored him on a current events test. Impressive achievements in the eyes of McGovern. I walked across the campus one day and took her hand. We got engaged just before I left home, but we decided we should wait until after the war. McGovern finally went into the Army Air Force in February 1943. When he left the Dakota Wesleyan campus, most of the students and faculty turned out to see him off. It was a kind of a festive occasion. The band was playing this peppy martial music. And then I saw my mother standing out there, tears just streaming down her face. It just broke my heart. I think my mother felt that she was looking at me possibly for the last time. McGovern traveled to Jefferson Barracks outside of St. Louis. At the age of 21, he may have been one of the older cadets, but he was certainly not one of the more worldly. The drill sergeant shocked him. They screamed their orders and punctuated every sentence with profanity. Far from home and lonely, his resolve to not marry before the end of the war softened. Finally, we decided why wait. So we got married at the end of primary training. I hitchhiked home to uh, Mitchell, South Dakota. My father presided at the wedding ceremony. That night, we went back to the flying field in Muskogee, Oklahoma. We sat up all night on a troop train. Through flight training, George and Eleanor saw little of each other. McGovern moved from base to base as his father had moved from church to church. Eleanor tagged behind. When he got his pilot's wings, she was there to pin them on. And when he faced the decision of what kind of pilot he wanted to be, Eleanor helped him make that decision. We had a choice of either becoming fighter pilots or combat bomber pilots. I chose the bombers, somehow those big four-engine birds that I'd seen fly over South Dakota a few times captured my fancy. And I decided that's what I wanted to do, and that's what I became. 
There was something about the big lumbering B-24s that reassured McGovern. It was as difficult to fly as the South Dakota Prairie had been to farm, as demanding of its pilots as his father had been of his son. The serious, earnest personality he developed in Depression-era South Dakota turned out to be exactly the personality a bomber pilot needs. McGovern's approach to flying was very much his approach to life. He was very cautious, he was very methodical, and he made sure that all the I's were dotted and all the T's were crossed. The disastrous losses of pilots, crews, and planes over Europe had thinned the Air Corps' ranks to the point where training schedules were shortened. In September 1944, McGovern said goodbye to his pregnant wife and went off to war. He arrived in Serignola, Italy, then six weeks later flew his first mission. At the time, AAF policy was that pilots had to fly five missions as co-pilot before they took command of their own aircraft, and then 30 more before being rotated home. McGovern's first mission aborted as the bomber approached the cloud-shrouded target. In his second mission, over a rail yard in Hungary, he encountered nightmarish flak, but came out unscathed. The third mission was a milk run, and the fourth again featured heavy flak. On his fifth mission, his last as a co-pilot, he dropped bombs on Zilm, Czechoslovakia. He knew on his next mission, he'd take off as captain of his own crew. And he knew that he had to complete 35 missions before he'd get back home. I didn't know that half of the bombers, <clears throat> the B-24s that I was flying with, never, never completed their missions. The crews went down sometime during the missions. In fact, the average crew never got beyond 17 missions. You were only half through at 17 missions. You had to fly another 18 after that. I'm glad I didn't know that at the time. After flying his first five combat missions as a co-pilot, Lieutenant George McGovern reunited with his own crew. He named his plane the Dakota Queen in honor of Eleanor, his pregnant wife. And on December 6, 1944, he lifted off for a rail marshalling yard in Austria. To McGovern, the plane seemed heavier, harder to maneuver on the taxiways than it had before. And he was very aware that the young men in his crew were now his responsibility. He was dealing with kids 20, 21, 22. He himself was 22 years old, but he had a much broader and more mature understanding of the fact that the lives of his crew members were in his hands. The planes ended up dropping their bombs in the Adriatic Sea after clouds obscured their target. It counted against the total of 35 missions needed to rotate home, despite the fact they had encountered no enemy. A week later, McGovern received word that his father had died while pheasant hunting back in South Dakota. McGovern's commanding officer offered to take him off the next day's mission, but McGovern insisted that he would go. If his crew was going, he felt he belonged with them. On that mission, his seventh, McGovern and his crew learned what combat was really all about. On the seventh, a shell exploded ahead of the nose of our airplane, a piece of shrapnel about that size, tore through the middle of that windshield and struck a, a large steel girder just over the head of the co-pilot sitting on my right and myself. This girder was across our head. It smashed into that girder and fell on the floor in front of the engineer who was standing up between the two of us. It could have taken off the head of either the co-pilot or mine if it had been eight or 10 inches left or right, or the engineer if it had been eight or 10 inches lower. From that time on, I knew we were in war. The air at 25,000 feet was freezing cold, and McGovern struggled to keep his plane in formation. He wrestled the Dakota Queen back to base, set it down smoothly, and noticed that his crew seemed to eye him with new respect. He had proved something to them by getting them home safely. Every few days after that, McGovern and the Dakota Queen crew would take off on another mission. 
Some were milk runs, relatively easy journeys with a minimum of enemy resistance. Others were nightmarish flights into dark clouds of flak, epic journeys that took the preacher's son into what seemed almost an Old Testament hell. And he knew that down on the ground, he was killing people. Sherman said, war is hell. It is hell. It's hell on the civilians, it's hell on the soldiers. So you can't brood about that too much or you'd, uh, you'd lose your sanity. And I didn't brood about it. I thought about winning the war, knocking the Nazis out of the war, and that's what you concentrated on, winning. There was, however, one incident in the war that aided McGovern for years. On a mission to the Scotia Ammunition Works in Czechoslovakia, a 500-pound bomb lodged in the bay of the Dakota Queen. McGovern knew the plane couldn't land with the bomb hanging precariously beneath it. Well, they kept working on it, and we came down quite a few thousand feet, and right at high noon, it broke loose just over the Austria-Italian Austria border. And uh, it was a clear day, and you could see what happened. It hit right in the middle of uh, a little Austrian farmyard. People that doubtless thought they were safely out of the war zone. McGovern, convinced that he'd wiped out a farm family just like the hundreds of farm families he knew back in South Dakota, flew the Dakota Queen back to base and landed it safely. Back at the base, he learned that his wife had given birth to his first child. And I thought, gosh, Eleanor and I have brought a new child into the world. She's 5,000 miles away, of course, back in South Dakota. The same day, I probably killed somebody else, somebody else's children. It was a bad scene. He flew more missions. On one, he blew a tire during takeoff, went ahead to the target, dropped his bombs, and executed an almost perfect landing on the blown tire. There was a saying, it probably doesn't make any, thing, it make any sense, but we used to say, if it has your name on it, you're gonna get it. If it doesn't, you're okay. And we always thought it didn't have our name on it. McGovern's crew developed an enormous amount of respect for the young skipper. One of the reasons that his crews were so happy with him was because he was very serious and mature in his approach to flying, and they could depend on him to do everything within his power to get them back alive. More than once, McGovern offered his crew the opportunity to bail out rather than land with him in a badly damaged aircraft. None of his crew members ever took him up on the offer. Eventually, McGovern and his crew worked their way to their last mission. We knew the United States was going to win the war, and uh, I didn't feel any special uh, fear about that 35th mission. I have to tell you, it was probably the worst mission of the war for us. The mission was to Lintz, the same railroad marshalling yards where Flack had knocked the windshield out of the Dakota Queen. Now it was over Lintz where McGovern's combat career would end. As the formation of B-24s approached the city, German 88 started firing in front of the planes. By fixing their guns on the box the planes would have to fly through to hit their targets, the Germans challenged the courage of the Allied pilots. They could see the black flak cloud ahead of them, and they knew that they could avoid it by turning away. McGovern didn't waver. That was the one where we got over 100 holes torn in the fuselage of that big airplane. We came back without any brakes. The hydraulic system was shot out. We had no flaps to, sl to slow the uh, landing speed. We couldn't put the gear down automatically. We had to crank it down laboriously by hand. And then we had this riddled old tub that we somehow had to keep together until we got to the landing field. With no brakes, McGovern ordered his crew to attach parachutes to the yoke supporting the waste guns. He had them tend to the waste gunner, who had a hunk of flak lodged deep in one leg. When he contacted the tower, they were surprised to hear from him. The Dakota Queen had already been listed as missing in action. When the plane touched the runway, crewmen threw the chutes out the windows to slow it down. It still ran past the end of the runway, 
carried their wounded crewmate out to the ambulance themselves. We were 10 men who knew our lives depended on teamwork and on the proficiency of the other members of the crew. McGovern returned home to his wife, to his new baby, and to the grave of his father. He returned to college on the GI Bill and eventually went into politics. Like a lot of veterans of World War II, he was never comfortable talking about his experience in battle. Even in the heat of the 1972 presidential election, when the anti-Vietnam War McGovern was labeled a coward by political opponents, he declined to capitalize on his 35 combat missions. And then, late in his life, his courage was challenged again when his daughter Terry died of alcoholism. Terry McGovern was a wonderful young woman, a delightful, intelligent, humane, uh, compassionate, witty person. And after years in and out of alcohol treatment programs, she froze to death in an alley after a drinking binge. I've always hoped that in uh, God's good time, that someday I'll learn why Terry died. I think I know the reasons. I think she was overcome by a malady she couldn't surpass. Uh, that test to her was more difficult than overcoming German anti-aircraft fire in World War II. And she, and she went down. McGovern learned that courage takes many forms. He saw his daughter's courage in fighting her illness and came to appreciate more his wife's courage in starting their family while he was flying in combat. One night, while appearing on German television, he told the story of the accidental bombing of the Austrian farm and how the vision of random and horrible death had agonized him over the years. It was a powerful story, one that was not easy for McGovern to tell. That night, an old Austrian farmer called the television station and said, tell the American senator who was on television tonight that that was my farm. I know because it was right at high noon. It was right in the area where he said, but we saw that lone bomber coming and we got our family out of the house. We hid in a ditch. Nobody was hurt. And furthermore, I hated Adolf Hitler. So if bombing my farm ended that war one minute earlier, tell the senator not to worry about it. 